Hello everyone, this is my third video summarizing Anders Edge Sapkowski's Witcher books, and this time I will be going over Blood of Elves. Both of Sapkowski's previous Witcher books were collections of short stories. I would recommend watching my previous videos if you haven't already, because the events in these stories play a big part of the background for the novel Blood of Elves. If I were to recommend any two stories to watch, then they would be Question of Price from The Last Wish and Something More from Sword of Destiny. I will provide links directly to these short stories in the video description below, so you can catch up if you need. Sapkowski's Sword of Destiny left off with Geralt catching up with Princess Cirilla, who has somehow escaped the destruction of her home of Sintra and been adopted by a merchant family. Geralt coincidentally meets her again and promises to stay with Ciri forever. Blood of Elves picks up seemingly days afterwards, as Geralt and Ciri are traveling together through some woods. Ciri is experiencing a nightmare. In the nightmare, Ciri is reliving her escape from Sintra. A knight is carrying her on his horse and protected by a small retinue of other knights as they flee the town while the Nilf Guardians are attacking. The town is in blazes and citizens are being slaughtered as Ciri and her guards ride. The knight who Ciri is sharing a horse with is eventually shot down by arrows and another knight picks her up. He doesn't make it far before he is also shot by arrows and this time Ciri is trapped under his horse. An intimidating Nilf Guardian knight approaches, clad in black, and nobody is there to help her. Ciri gets a frightening look at the man's eyes through the narrow visor on his winged helm before Geralt is able to shake her awake from the nightmare. Ciri asks Geralt what the knight in black did to her because she cannot remember. Geralt responds by telling her that it was just a dream and the dream will not bother her again. Ciri has so much faith in Geralt and her destiny with him that Ciri believes him and she goes back to sleep. In a change of scene, the bard Dandelion has just finished a ballad in a glade under a great oak tree known as Bleoborus. The glade is a well-known rest stop for travelers, so a crowd of over a hundred wizards and poor humans and nobles, elves, dwarves, gnomes, halflings, and all are in attendance, and praising Dandelion's ballad. But one woman asks Dandelion to finish the story which he apparently has left on a cliffhanger. She further says that, while no names were used in the ballad, everyone in the audience knows that the story is that of Geralt, Yennefer, and Ciri, and the crowd's very interested in what happened to these legends. Dandelion responds by saying the characters are in fact fiction, and politely avoids any further questions. At this point, the argument begins to rage across the crowd, and it is basically a clever method for Sapkowski to summarize the events that happen in the short stories. These arguments also reveal the tensions between the different species, in particular between humans, dwarves, and elves. In the northern kingdoms like Temeria and Edern, all species except humans are treated as second-class citizens. When Nilfgaard recently invaded, the Nilfgaardians promised to uplift the elves and dwarves if they helped with the attack. This inspired many elves and dwarves to join a band of rebels called Skoyatel, or squirrels, who would commit terror-like attacks on human settlements. Many dwarves and elves also stood with northern kingdoms against the Skoyatel because they suppose that the Nilfgaardians are lying and just trying to exploit them. While these arguments rage across the audience, Dandelion slips away unnoticed. Dandelion is next found in a brothel with a girl on each arm when the matron, Mama Lantieri, comes in to announce that Dandelion has a noble visitor. The man says that he saw the ballad in the glade and is very interested in the whereabouts of Princess Cirilla. He introduces himself as Ryance and offers Dandelion a large bag of gold in exchange for the information. Dandelion refuses and tries to dismiss Ryance. But Ryance responds by threatening to use more forceful methods if Dandelion does not cooperate and just give the information on Ciri and take his gold. Dandelion runs for a secret passage that he's often used to escape debtors or angry husbands, but this time he is stunned by a paralysis spell, falls down the stairs in the passage, and blacks out. When Dandelion wakes up, he finds himself in the pigsty, where the secret passage leads to, and unable to open his mouth due to a spell. Ryance and two of his goons are in the pigsty with him. Dandelion is tied up so that the goons can heave on some ropes and stretch him apart, potentially breaking Dandelion's hands and ending his career as a bard. Ryance makes all of this clear to Dandelion, and also states he can magically detect any lies. Ryance then lifts the spell and allows Dandelion to talk. He resumes his questioning about Ciri, and he's not really expressing any interest in Geralt. Ryance doesn't even know exactly what Geralt's name is. Dandelion tells Ryance the story of how Geralt and Ciri were bound to each other. He also tells Ryance about how Geralt went down to finally claim Ciri, but the Nilfgaardians had attacked. Geralt gave up on Ciri at this point, and fled north of Dandelion. 
They parted ways at Hangfors, and Dandelion has never seen Geralt since. Bryant now knows that he will not be able to get any useful information on Ciri from Dandelion, so he begins asking about Geralt to see if the Witcher can be found and lead him to Ciri. When asked where the Witcher would normally go to hide, Dandelion responds with, I don't know where it is. Ryan responds with, quote, You don't know where it is, you say, but I warrant you know what it is, end quote. Dandelion is now trapped and can no longer beat around the bush, so he remains silent. The torture gets worse and worse, but just before his hands are rendered useless, one of the goons alerts all present that somebody is coming to the pigsty. Dandelion is put down while Ryan and his goons prepare to ambush the visitor. The door opens and a small woman walks in. When Ryan's goons try to attack, the woman goes up in smoke, and then the real woman comes in, killing the goons with a knife and a lightning spell. Ryan tries to paralyze her, but the spell is easily deflected. Knowing he is outmatched, Ryan opens a portal and hops through it. The woman chases after him and blasts fire into the portal. Ryan can be heard screaming as the portal closes. At this point, the woman reveals herself to be Yennefer, and she comes to Dandelion's aid. They move to a nearby tavern, and Dandelion fills her in on what happened and asks how she knew where to find him. She says she was also at his performance in the glade, but was not willing to follow Dandelion into the brothel. She waited outside and heard hushed noises coming from the pigsty and went to investigate. The conversation goes for a while, so I'll highlight the key things they say. Um, Yennefer eventually says that she used to hate Dandelion, but now likes him. She says she is grateful to him, but will not say what for. Yennefer says she has also not seen Geralt, and that, for a while after the war, she didn't see anyone. Uh, Yennefer tells Dandelion to not sing about Ciri again. Dandelion doesn't really understand why everybody cares about her, but agrees to not sing about her considering recent events. Yennefer says that she has never heard of or met Ryans before, but he is clearly a poor wizard. Somebody much more powerful must have helped him open the portal. Yennefer did not jump through the portal for fear it would lead to the powerful sorcerer helping Ryans. Dandelion points out to Yennefer that Ryans is probably Nilfgaardian, judging by the words he used when discussing the Battle of Sintra. Most northerners would call it a slaughter instead, for example. Their conversation concludes with Dandelion trying to convince Yennefer to go to Geralt and warn him. While Dandelion may know the name of the place Geralt is at, Yennefer actually knows how to get there. But Yennefer says she's not seen Geralt for over a year and will not force her help on him. Plus, the place that Geralt is at is not a place you go without invitation. The conversation ends, but not before Yennefer tells Dandelion that she is grateful to him for keeping Geralt company and stopping Geralt from being alone. The scene will now switch again as Geralt and Ciri arrive at the Witcher Fortress and home base, Kaer Morin. They enter a dark tunnel where the Witcher Eskel greets them. While Eskel and Geralt catch up, Ciri is frightened by Eskel's scarred face and the rats running around her. Eskel is not too pleased that Geralt has brought a girl to the fortress. They meet the other three witchers in the fort named Vesemir, Lambert, and Cohen. They all frighten Ciri at first, but Geralt puts his hands on her shoulders and it almost magically soothes her. He introduces Ciri to the witchers as our destiny. If you remember in the short story Something More, there was a sorceress who died at Sodden named Triss Marigold. Triss is well known for her long red hair and is a good friend of Yennefer and Geralt. We start the next chapter following Triss Marigold, apparently alive and well, as she slowly rides towards Kaer Morin. As she gets close to her destination, she realizes she is next to a trail-slash-obstacle course, which the witchers in training often call the Killer. She hears somebody coming on the path and waits to see the witcher run by, amazed at the grace. She runs into the witcher again on the trail, except this time they trip. Triss comes up to help the potentially injured witcher, and is surprised to see it is a girl with large green eyes and gray hair, Ciri. She is some, she's in some very beat up leather clothes, and considers herself a witcher. Triss introduces herself, and uses magic to realize that Ciri is not fully a witcher yet. There are many trials left for her to take. They ride to Kaer Morin together on Triss's horse, and ride past piles of skulls and bones. Ciri's asks why the witchers do not bury them. Triss lies and says she does not know. But she also thinks to herself about how the witchers use the skulls as a reminder. Centuries ago, the townspeople nearby were so frightened by the witchers, and they were also incited by a wizard, that the people attacked the fort. 
there were many casualties on each side. While Triss is thinking about this, Siri enters a daze. A magical aura forms around her, and her voice changes, as she begins talking to Triss about death. The enraptured Siri tells Triss to leave and take the Child of Elder Blood with her. If Triss does not leave with Siri, then death will claim Triss for good. Siri suddenly jerks out of it, and the magical aura is gone, but she has no memory of what was said. Siri thought she just dozed to sleep. Triss is amazed at how magically charged Siri had just been, but now she can find no trace of it, as the two of them reach Kaer Morin. Lambert immediately takes Siri with him to continue training. Triss was asked to come to Kaer Morin, but none of the Witchers will tell her why. Geralt has changed a lot since they last met, and any hopes she had of continuing a romantic relationship are dashed by a look in his eyes. While talking privately, Geralt tells Triss that he saw her name on a tombstone at Sodden, and he is miffed at how anybody could make the mistake. Triss says she'll explain it later. When Geralt tries to say he is happy to see her, Triss moves in to kiss him, but Geralt immediately puts a stop to it. Triss, Geralt, Cohen, and Visimir are walking through the fort when they find Ciri and Lambert training. Triss uses this opportunity to figure out what the Witchers are doing with the girl. They claim she is without a family and needs a home. The Witchers are giving her that and training her in the meantime, but they do not intend to make her into a Witcher. Any further questioning on Triss's part is unsuccessful. She has dinner and goes to bed. In bed, she is left to think about why she's at Kaer Morin. She gets a little sidetracked and we learn a bit about Geralt and Triss's background. Triss was amazed at how Geralt and Yennefer stuck together, even though a relationship only brought each other pain. When Geralt and Yennefer had offended each other at some point, she charmed Geralt, possibly using some magic to help, and found what made Geralt so special. Triss values Yennefer more than Geralt as a friend, but she also enjoyed her time with him. Geralt seems to have moved on, though, as Triss goes through the night without him. Triss looks back at dinner and recognizes that the Witchers may not be turning Ciri into a Witcher, but they are giving her some stimulants in her food and drinks. They are trying to hide this from Triss, but she sees through it, and Triss finally comes to the correct conclusion for why she was invited. The Witchers do not know what to do about Ciri's on and off magical abilities, which is a cause of the Source. If you remember in the story Question of Price, Ciri's mother Pavetta is also a Source. The other thing about Sources is that they usually are not able to control their magical abilities. Other than that, I really don't know what a Source is other than it's some feared and mystical form of magic. Perhaps it will be more explained in future books. Regardless, Ciri has a Source, and the Witchers know it, and they need somebody with magical experience to help them handle it. The only sorcerers or sorceress they could trust is Triss and Yennefer. Triss does not know why she was invited to Kaer Morin and not Yennefer. The next day is spent with Triss trying to get the Witchers to treat Ciri more like a lady and recognize that they cannot treat her like a Witcher. The Witchers often adopt the roughest people out there, but the trials and exercises kill them. What chance does a princess have? Geralt reply, Geralt's reply gives us some background on what happened between Ciri's um, nightmare at Sentra and her finding Geralt, and I'll go ahead and put this on the screen. But when Triss points out that Ciri is unknown to the Witchers on her period, then Triss has won. Triss also argues that the Witchers need to reduce the amount of supplements they give Ciri because they could affect her physical growth and halt the development of womanly attributes. Geralt points out to Triss that he will be taking Ciri to the goddess Miletel's temple in the spring so she may be raised by his friend Nanek. Triss and Ciri get along well with each other almost immediately. In the next conversation between Triss and the Witchers, they finally go into detail about Ciri and her magical abilities as a source. Triss is obliged to tell the chapter of mages about Ciri, but she tells the Witcher she's not going to do it. There is no need to upset the Witchers by telling the chapter, especially if telling the chapter will have no effect. Triss acknowledges that Ciri has a destiny, and it will occur whether Triss tells the chapter about Ciri or not. Witcher Lambert gets in an argument with Triss about whether Ciri is actually a source because Ciri cannot even cast a simple Witcher sign. Geralt comes to Triss's defense and relates how Ciri's mother, Pavetta, seemed to have no magical talents, and then she almost single handedly tore down a castle on accident. Now that Triss has promised not to report back to the chapter, the Witchers are open about their previous scares with Ciri. There have been three instances where she fell into a trance like the one she had with Triss. One was caused by drinking a glass of what witchers call White Seagull, one was after she had banged her head, and one was during one of her nightmares. 
Nobody could make out what she said in the first two trances, but in the last one she prophesied the death of Cohen and Geralt. Before Ciri could go to bed, Triss gives her a glass of white seagull. Ciri enters the trance and begins dancing around the hall. Triss takes out a sapphire amulet, presses it against Ciri's head, and enters her mind in an attempt to figure out, quote, what magic she is transmitting, how, and from where she is drawing the aura, end quote. The dream is a mess to put things lightly, but Ciri and Triss end up back at the Sorcerer's Hill at Sodden, where Triss was supposedly buried. Ciri at one point says, quote, It is the rose, the rose of Sherawed. I pricked myself, it is nothing. It is only blood, the blood of elves. This may not mean anything yet, but it'll pop up later. Another thing she says now, but will make sense later, is, The lion cub must die. Reasons of state. Whoever or whatever is possessing Ciri eventually takes control of the girl. Triss tries several spells and incantations to reveal what is doing it to her, but she's no match. Before Ciri and Triss are kicked out of the dream, the thing possessing Ciri says, She is not a child. She is the flame. The white flame which will set light to the world. She is the elder blood, Hen Icker. The blood of elves. The seed which will not sprout but burst into flame. The, the blood which will be defiled. When Ted Dierda arrives, the time of end, Vaisa Dierda Ip again. This last line translates to something is going to end. This stuff seems important, so I'm including it, but just adds up, it's not explained in Blood of Elves. As the two girls fly out of the dream, Ciri screams to Triss, forget about him, don't torture him, forget. When Triss wakes, she is in bed with Geralt, who's been looking after her in a professional and non-romantic manner. Triss tells Geralt that Ciri is an extremely strong medium, and that something is trying to possess her. If Ciri has one more trance like this, then it could destroy her mind. Triss says she will stay until spring, and go with Geralt to take her to Militel's temple. Then Geralt will get Yennefer to come to the temple, and help. While they are discussing this, they also lay down the terms of their relationship. Triss calls herself Geralt's mistake. Geralt tries to soothe her by saying that Triss is still important to him. Geralt also heard Ciri telling Triss to forget about him at the end of the dream. Triss says she will not torture Geralt, but she cannot forget him. She asks for Geralt's forgiveness, but Geralt says he should be asking for Triss's forgiveness as well as Yennefer's. This is all referencing how Geralt came to Triss in a moment of weakness before. Ciri remains unconscious for another ten days, and Triss keeps a constant eye on her both during and after this period. In the time before spring, Triss teaches Ciri about history, lore, and manners, while the witchers continue training her in swordplay and monster slaying. One day, not long before spring, the witchers were talking about where they would set out to and continue their career of slaying monsters. Lambert and Cohen, the younger witchers, are discussing moving to Sodden because there are always more monsters in the aftermath of a large battle. Triss fought at Sodden to stop the Nilf Guardians from killing hundreds, so she does not respond kindly to these comments. She calls out the witchers on the hypocrisy of protecting people from monsters that kill a few people in a year, but yet the witchers refuse to stand against an army which kill thousands. Her scorn is not even saved on Geralt. Geralt says he is a witcher who has no motivation to fight in a war. He exists to kill monsters, not fight for one king or another. He asks, quote, Should I, if it comes to another battle for Sodden, stand with you on the hill, shoulder to shoulder, and fight for freedom? Triss replies, I'd be, bra I'd be proud and happy to fight at your side. She continues to hold the moral high ground by saying she works with kings to try and stop wars rather than profit from them as the witchers callously suggested. Triss also had no motivation to fight in that war, but she did anyways. She goes into detail about what happened at Sodden, and I would recommend pausing the video to read it. This is as graphic as Sapkowski has gotten so far, and it has a powerful effect. Also, if you recall in Yennefer and Dandelion's conversation earlier, Yen said that she did not see anyone for a while after the war. This explains what she really meant by that. All the wizards who were wounded at the hill received extensive magical treatment to repair any scars and heal any ailments. But Triss said if she had to stand on that hill again, then she would do it. Ciri had snuck into the room to listen while everyone was focused on Triss. Ciri loudly says she would also stand by Triss so she could kill the Nilf Guardians who attacked Sintra. Geralt responds poorly to this because witchers are trained to protect, not be assassins. 
He says Siri will not train again until she gets this straight. Siri runs away in tears. She is an emotional girl, and Geralt is cold and detached. Triss knows that a witcher's emotions are killed by the trial of grasses. She also thinks that the trial is not what killed Geralt's emotions, but that he killed him himself. Now he is so sick of emotions that he is considering putting Siri through the trial of grasses to make the girl more acceptable in his eyes. Even though Triss has just verbally abused Geralt for all this, the two of them go together to sue Siri on the wall. While up there, they all realize that spring has come. In the next scene, Triss, Siri, and Geralt are a couple days out from Kaer Morin, when Triss begins showing signs of dysentery. Triss is allergic to most potions and usually treats herself using amulets, but none are available. Triss eventually reads the po reaches the point where she cannot ride, and the three are forced to seek aid at a fort overseeing a bridge in Kedwin. The fort has just been attacked by the Scoia'tael, and there were a few casualties. I highlighted the difficulties between the humans and squirrels at the start of the summary. Basically, the humans have a history of abusing other races like elves and dwarves, and groups are starting to rebel. Some think that they are being inspired by the Nilf Guardians who are trying to do dis sow discord in the north. They fight using guerrilla tactics, and the humans are at a loss on how to fight back. Sometimes the humans turn to terrorizing innocent dwarves and elves just to provoke an attack, and the squirrels will also attack innocent humans on the highways to terrorize them. The situation's only getting worse. The fort will not allow Geralt to stay with Triss just in case her disease spreads. They advise Geralt to take a slight detour and join a caravan so as to not have to travel alone in Scoia'tael territory. Geralt follows this advice and the three set out. When he does catch up to it, he finds his friend Yarpin Zigrin and his five companions. Yarpin was a very funny dwarf who Geralt joined in a dragon hunt at the start of Sword of Destiny. One of Yarpin's dwarves got married and settled down, so the count is at five instead of six. Yarpin introduces Geralt to the leader of the caravan, Commissar Wilfred Wenk, in service of King Hensult of Kedwin. Yarpin and Wenk quickly agree to help Geralt, Triss, and Ciri. Yarpin asks if Triss may have an infectious disease like typhoid or dysentery. Geralt says that wizards cannot catch diseases, she simply has food poisoning. While it is true that wizards cannot get diseases, Triss seems to be an exception, though this is never fully explained. Regardless, Geralt lies to ensure that Triss gets some care for the night. Whether or not Geralt, Triss, and Ciri can join the caravan when the camp breaks the next morning is up for debate. The human Wenk is in charge of the caravan, but most of the crew are dwarven. Geralt asks Yarpin what it is that they are transporting. Yarpin is clearly lying when he claims that they are just shipping ordinary military supplies, but Geralt does not ask further. Yarpin has questions for Geralt as well about Triss and Ciri. While Geralt manages to shy away from talking about Triss, he also claims rather quickly that Ciri is his, implying his daughter. The next morning, Geralt, Yarpin, and Wink discuss Geralt joining the caravan with Triss in a wagon. The woods in the area are known to be infested with Scoia'tael, so Wink suggests hiring Geralt as extra protection. Geralt refuses. He will not kill the Elvish and Dwarven bandits should they attack because he does not see their human rulers as any better. He instead offers to be an errand boy for the caravan, and Wink slowly agrees to this. The caravan travels for ten days with Geralt, Ciri, and Triss. The interactions between Yarpin, Ciri, and Geralt are some of the funniest parts of the series so far, but I'll limit this summary to the semi-important bits as far as character story and lore go. At one point, a drunk Yarpin, drunk Yarpin, gets so angry at Geralt and his neutrality on the Scoia'tael human conflict that Yarpin tells Geralt to get off the cart. Ciri begins talking to Yarpin after Geralt has moved elsewhere, and Yarpin opens up a bit to Ciri. He states that he does not side with the Scoia'tael because the different species have been improving relations for hundreds of years. Now the Nilf Guardians are taking advantage of young rebels and breaking down centuries of progress. Yarpin also refers to a hero named Elorina, who begged for forgiveness. Yarpin wants to live in a way where he does not have to beg for forgiveness, like Elorina did. Ciri has no idea who Elorina is, but she decides that this is not a good time to ask Yarpin to clarify. Later, the caravan is inspected by guards, who are checking for any signs of human trafficking. They ask what is in all of the barrels the transport is carrying, and the response is salt fish. The caravan is allowed to keep going with a warning that there is heavy Scoia'tael presence ahead. Yarpin Zigrin will later hint to Geralt that the barrels hold very valuable items, like gold gems and jewelry, which could help fund a war. Not long after the caravan gets moving again, 
Siri hops on her horse and goes flying ahead. She seems bored of trudging along with a caravan and decides on her own to be a forward scout on the look for Scoyatel. While on her own, she begins thinking about what happened when Sintra was sacked by the Nilf Guardians and decides that she will fight to defend humans from other humans if necessary. This is decidedly the opposite of Geralt's views on the subject of who a witcher should fight. While she is thinking about this, she spots some movement ahead and goes to hide behind some bushes. She watches three elves pass by her and waits a while to make sure the coast is clear. When she tries to stand up, she discovers that somebody is grabbing her by the ankle. It is Geralt. Siri tells Geralt that they must warn the caravan that an attack is coming. Geralt says it is not necessary. Yarpin's caravan is largely staffed by dwarves in hopes that the Scoyatel will not engage them. The squirrels had actually been following them for days and have not done anything yet. Geralt then tells Siri to come with him so that he may show her why there are so many elves in the area. He leads her to an old elven palace named Sherawed. The elves themselves destroyed it two centuries ago to stop the humans from conquering it and then building a city on top of it. The elves would then retreat into the mountains in hopes that the humans would come and go. At the center of the palace was a ruined fountain and a sculpture of a beautiful elvish woman. Geralt says that the woman was named Elorin, but the dwarves and humans call her Elorina. This is the woman Yarpin was naming earlier. The elder elves were willing to destroy Sherawed and flee to the mountains, but Elorin inspired the elvish youth to stay and fight the humans. They decided to die honorably and uh, fight the human invaders. Elorina and her followers managed to do just that, die honorably. But the elves lost so many of their youth due to Elorina's honorable intentions that the elves are hardly able to continue having children. Now Elorina is a symbol for both the Scoyatel as well as for the elves and dwarvens looking for a peaceful resolution. Her actions still inspire the youth, but the consequences of her actions are evidence that people like Yarpin use to point out nothing good will come from the conflict. Under the statue is a rose bush where beautiful roses wildly grow. Ciri asks Geralt and then takes one. Earlier in this book, Triss entered a dream of Ciri's and Ciri said, quote, It is the rose, the rose of Sherawed. I pricked myself. It is nothing. It is only blood, the blood of elves. As Ciri is pinning the rose to her clothes, she pricks herself. She has a short vision of Triss, Yarpin, Wink, and the rest of the caravan being attacked. In a voice which is not her own, she tells Geralt that they must go back. Ciri and Geralt arrive in the middle of an attack by the Scoyatel. Triss had somehow ended up on the ground, and Ciri drags her under an overturned wagon. Although Geralt said he would not engage any Scoyatel invaders, he quickly jumps in the action and begins defending his friends. Wink is struck by two arrows and slumps in his saddle. A dwarf with a caravan grabbed him and dragged him to the wagon with Triss and Ciri. The dwarf, Polly, then comes face to face with the Scoyatel dwarf. While Polly paused, the squirrel did not and immediately cut Polly down. Ciri screams and is too frightened to defend herself. Yarpin only barely saves her in time and kills the Scoyatel dwarf. Ciri then found herself face to face and defenseless against a female elf. But before Ciri receives a killing blow, the elf sees the rose pinned on Ciri's shirt. The elf pauses and it gives Geralt enough time to come and kill her. Ciri loses consciousness not long after. When Ciri wakes, the battle is over. Apparently the guards who inspected the caravan earlier had turned around and joined the fight. Triss is feeling better and treating wounded. In the chaos, many of the barrels which the caravan was transporting had fallen out of the wagon and bust open. But instead of valuables which could fund a war, the barrels only contained worthless rocks. Apparently the entire convoy was an attempt to see if Yarpin was a secret Scoyatel agent. If the caravan was attacked, then it would be supposed that Yarpin had leaked the information. But Wink, with his dying breath, says that Yarpin was loyal to the king through and through. Ciri, Triss, and Geralt decide to depart from the caravan now that Triss is feeling better. But first, Ciri takes the Rose of Sherawed and places it on the body of the female elf who almost killed her. The next big, big section jumps around and goes from character to character a lot. I tried to think of a more coherent way to organize all this, but I decided to just go with the order Sapkowski used when he wrote the book. The plot jumps ahead several months at the start of the next chapter, and Sapkowski spends a while summarizing what has since happened. Basically, Geralt, Triss, and Ciri arrived at Militel's temple and put Ciri in Nanek's care. 
Geralt then wrote a letter to Yennefer asking for her help. Geralt had not spoken to Yennefer in years prior to this letter, so he addresses it to Dear Friend, and Yennefer will make him regret that in her reply. He also does not specifically state what it is that he needs help with in the letter, but Yennefer made several hints toward a source in her reply. Triss and Geralt went their separate ways after Milatel's temple, and he is now working as a guard on a ferry boat. Apparently, the waters in the area have become inhabited by a large monster, so the ferry company is paying to have Geralt ride it back and forth, ready to slay the monster if, if it comes. He is on the barge, rereading letters which he had been holding on to from Ciri and Yennefer. Ciri essentially tells Geralt about all the stuff the Neck is teaching her and about day-to-day -day life. I've put Yennefer's entire reply message on the screen because it's pretty funny. Feel free to pause the video and read it if you want. But, in short, Yennefer seems to already know what Geralt needs from her and she immediately sets out. To clarify, this letter was written months ago, so Yennefer is already at Milatel's temple. As he finishes reading the letter, the skipper, who is either named Boatbug or that is his nickname, approaches Geralt. Geralt has apparently asked Boatbug in the past to keep an ear open for people asking about him. Boatbug now follows up on this and points out a man who has been asking about Geralt. The man approaches and it is Linus Pitt. He is a scholar and discusses what monsters could be lurking in the waters. Geralt suspects that it is a monster called an Eshna. Pitt does not believe an Eshna could exist in these parts, and the two of them get in a long debate. As they are discussing this, Redanian customs officers come on board to tax the ferry passengers. Apparently Nilfgaard has been cheaply manufacturing goods, sending them to Temeria, and then from Temeria they get to Redania. Redania cannot compete, and the cheap goods are destroying their economy. Nilfgaard seems to be pursuing an economic war to weaken them. Pitt, Geralt, Boatbug, and the leader of the customs boat named Olsen are all sitting on the rail of the ship and talk for a bit. Olsen eventually reveals to Geralt that the Temerian guards have also been asking about him, and whether he was traveling alone or with a young girl. A man named Ryance, with a burn on his left cheek, is the one who is paying the guards to ask these questions. Geralt has apparently been warned about Ryance by Dandelion or Yennefer at some point. Geralt responds by telling Boatbug that his contract is over and he is getting off at the next port. Almost as if on cue, they see a Temerian guard boat approaching from the distance. Olsen and Geralt are somewhat friends, and Olsen says that since Redania is currently inspecting the vessel, it is considered Redanian soil, so the Temerians will not be allowed to board. Geralt, however, asks that Olsen not interfere. It turns out that he wants to meet Ryans. He so publicly worked for the ferry company with hopes they would draw the attention of whomever is hunting him. The Temerian guards board and ask for Gerald, that's spelt with a D at the end and not a T, of Rivia. They are clearly more interested in looking for Ciri than Geralt himself. Geralt steps forward so he can be arrested, but Olsen said that Redania has already arrested Geralt, and he asked the Temerian guards to join him back to Redania. That way, they can present their seals and orders, and they can figure out who gets Geralt. It quickly becomes apparent that the Temerian guards do not have any seals or orders. They are guards who have gone rogue, and keep asking where Geralt is hiding the girl. Olsen threatens to do a customs check on the Temerian guard vessel, and this throws the leader of the guards in a panic. He takes a boy and holds him hostage as he backs towards the railing. This is when the Eshna decides to make an appearance and pull the leader of the guards off the boat, and the boy with him. Those on the boat throw spears at the Eshna, as well as killing the rogue guards. Geralt uses the thrown spears to distract the Eshna long enough for the boy to be pulled out of the water. Geralt is pulled back on board after more skirmishing with the Eshna and the leader of the guards. Geralt was hoping to keep at least one of the guards alive so that he could question him. Unfortunately, they were all killed by the ferry passengers, customs officer, or the Eshna. The Eshna was injured but managed to get away. The story then switches to following Dandelion. He is at Oxenfurt, which is also one of the destinations of Geralt's ferry. Dandelion knows that two people are following him, so he decides to visit a friend at the Academy of Oxenfurt, where Dandelion himself graduated from and then taught. He finds his friend named Shawnee, a medical student with short red hair. He points out the people following him, and she immediately recognizes that they are spies. Dandelion is not worried about them but he asks if Shawnee can do him a favor, and then whispers in her ear. What Dandelion's plan is we can't say, but Shawnee immediately expresses interest in meeting a witcher. 
Not long after they separated, the two spies approach Dandelion and say, Greetings from Digixtra. They are there to give Dandelion an escort to see Digixtra, the head of King Vizimir of Redania's spy network. Dandelion is actually one of Digixtra's agents. He was tasked with investigating what Ryans wanted with Geralt. Dandelion has been keeping information to himself, though, and Digistra has now found out. Digistra has called Dandelion in to get to the bottom of this. With him is the famous sorceress Philippa Alhart. Dandelion says he was never under Digistra's command, he only reports things when he feels like it in order to prevent tragedies from occurring. Digistra has asked that Dandelion bring Geralt in so that he may ask Geralt some questions. Dandelion lies and says Geralt has left town. Digixtra points out that Geralt could be in danger, because Tamaria is apparently very interested in what happened to their guards on the barge. He claims that if Geralt comes in voluntarily, that he can protect them. Philippa Eilhart decides that it may be worthwhile to go ahead and ask Dandelion the questions they want to ask Geralt. These are, where is the girl that Geralt has been seen traveling with? Where did Yennefer go after receiving a letter from Geralt? And where has Triss gone into hiding and why? Dandelion cannot answer any of these questions. It is very possible that he does not even know the answers. Digixtra and Philippa let Dandelion go, but they request that, should Geralt pop up, please ask him to come by. Dandelion does not see anyone trailing him when he leaves, and that scares him. He goes back to the academy and hangs out with friends, before sneaking out through a hidden exit he used to use when he was a student. Hoping he lost any well-hidden people trailing him, Dandelion goes to a nearby inn and climbs in the through the attic window. He walks in on Shawnee and Geralt naked in bed. Dandelion's belief that Shawnee is an innocent and sweet girl are continuously trampled from this point forward. Dandelion lets Geralt know that Digixtra is interested in tracking down Ciri and Yennefer. Geralt begins packing up to leave when an owl lands on the windowsill and then transforms into Philippa Eilhart. Dandelion makes introductions before Philippa tells all present that King Vizimir has ordered Digixtra to find the location of Ciri. Although Eilhart is on Vizimir's council, she was never told about this, so she somehow knows about these orders, but she disagrees with them. It would be awkward for her to tell the king that the orders are a bad idea, considering she shouldn't know about them in the first place. So she is here to make sure that King Vizimir cannot find Ciri. Geralt quickly figures out what this means. The kings are not the only ones interested in Ciri, but also the Council of Wizards. But Geralt does not know why everyone is so interested in her. Philippa still will not tell him, but says that he must guard her like the apple of his eye. In all of this dialogue, both Geralt and Philippa express an interest in finding out who Ryans is. Shawnee quietly speaks up and says, and asks if Ryans has a third degree burn on his face. If so, then she knows where to find him. Instead of proceeding with the action, the story changes scene again. At some point in the past, several kings and queens had a meeting at the castle of Bruja, and this may explain why everyone is so interested in Ciri. This part of the book is written from a third-person point of view, just like the rest of the book, but it also feels like you are seeing things from the perspective of somebody hidden in the room and spying. Vizimir, Demowind, Foltest, Hensolt, and Meave are all present and discussing Nilfgaard. Some think that Nilfgaard is building up to attack again, while others think that they are licking wounds, and will not move any further than the Yuruga. Nilfgaard may still hold Sentra, but they will have a tough time making it through the Verdant defenses. Remnants of the Sentra fleet, led by Jarl Krak and Krait, are also raiding Nilfgaardian vessels like pirates, keeping the Nilfgaards off balance. Meave then asks those present if it is better to wait for Nilfgaard to inevitably attack again, or to begin fighting back. They all agree that the Nilfgaardians have sent the Scoia'tael after them, as well as disrupting their economy, so action must be taken down. They also accuse Nilfgaard of sending a lot of prophets and mystics into their land, spreading stories of some white flame and white queen from the south. They shoot back and forth on ideas like committing pogroms against the non-humans to cut back on Scoia'tael activity, or helping Jarl Kraken Krait with his raiding parties but King Foltest suggests retaking Sentra. Everyone pretty quickly agrees to this, but the concern is that they do not want to be considered the aggressors. They decide to stage a fake attack at a border fort to give cause for their invasion of Sentra. 
a joint attack by the kingdoms and backed by about 8,000 Censor refugees could be successful. The next concern is what would happen with Censor once it is taken. There are rumors that Ciri survived, but nobody knows where she is, and it's been two years since Censor was taken. Nobody immediately admits that they are looking for the girl, but it pretty quickly turns out that almost all of them are. They begin accusing each other of trying to find the girl and marry her off to somebody in the royal family so that they can add Sintra to their kingdom. They at one point even suggest that the emperor of Nilfgaard, Emhir Var Emrys, may also be looking for the girl to marry her. If Emhir is successful in this, then they would be able to count on Sintra refugees returning to Sintra and then possibly joining the Nilfgaardians if they invade again. All parties agree that this is a dire consequence, but they are also afraid of each other marrying Ciri off and taking Sintra for themselves. So, to make sure they can all trust each other, all present agree to kill Ciri if they find her. The next scene is in Emhir Var Emrys' office. Marshal Cohorn is the new governor of Sintra, and he is explaining that several kings and queens just had a meeting in private and that no wizards were invited. The emperor asks Cohorn to ensure that the wizards know of this meeting and that they were not invited to sow distrust between the kings and their wizards. Cohorn acknowledges this and then points out that Ryance has not reported in. The last thing Cohorn tells M here is that the rebellion in Sintra has been put down. M here orders the leader, Duke Windholm, to be publicly executed in a painful and drawn out method. M here next gives Cohorn a message which he would like relayed to Ryance. Ryance is to stop toying around with Geralt. The Emperor has apparently dealt with Geralt before and knows that he is too smart to lead anyone to the girl. Ryance is to have Geralt killed. A knight in black armor and cape is then guided into the Emperor's office. He has been in jail for two years because he has apparently made a huge mistake during the attack on Sentra. The Emperor is giving him a chance to make up for the mistake and save himself from the headman's axe. Although it is never clearly stated, it is certainly suggested that this is the Black Knight who Ciri has had nightmares about. The Emperor says that he has a very important task for both of them before the scene changes again. We are now following Ciri again. She has just woken from a dream where she felt she was a bird overwatching Geralt, a strange man in a green hat, and a girl in a green cloak with a hood. Obviously Ciri is th seeing things from Philippa Isleheart's perspective. Shawnee explains that sometimes she steals medical supplies from the school and sells them to a shady man named Mirman. It was one time when she was at Mirman's house that she saw riots, but that is where Ciri's dream ended. Back at Milatel's temple, the Neck is lecturing Yennefer for abusing Ciri and pushing her past her limits. Ciri decides to fall back asleep and continue watching Geralt through her dreams, but that is not the dream she has. Instead, she finds herself in a long, dark corridor holding Yennefer's hand. Ciri feels that they are being watched. Yennefer is walking very quickly down the corridor and multiple doors are opening in front of them. They finally arrive at one door which will not open. Ciri feels that there is something on the other side of the door waiting for her. Yennefer continues to pull Ciri to the door and Ciri says she feels betrayed. I have a pretty difficult time figuring out everything about these dreams so I'm going to go ahead and include a pretty big portion of this dream on the screen. We'll see this final door referred to later in the book, as well as a certain quote, but I'm not really sure what to make all of this, other than the clear reference to the Black Knight who Ciri caught, or who caught Ciri in Sintra. Ciri wakes from the dream, and Yennefer is by her side, watching over her. She tries to tell Yennefer about the dream, but Yennefer says she already knows what it was. The scene jumps back to following Philippa, Shawnee, Dandelion, and Geralt. Shawnee pretends that she has brought some supplies to sell to get Miram to let her in. As he slowly opens up the door, one of Geralt's fists comes flying in and knocks him out. When Miraman wakes, he plays dumb and claims to not know who Ryance is. Geralt is having none of it and threatens to start, off cu start cutting off body parts and feeding them to the eels. But Philippa offers a more painful and bloodless form of interrogation. The scene actually jumps a couple times here, but I'll cover that stuff later. For now, I'll stay with Geralt's group. It seems that Philippa's interrogation was successful and left Mirman in a state of permanent idiocy, but not before he confessed to owning an amulet which would call Ryan's. Geralt waits outside Mirman's home and drinks some elix elixirs while waiting for Ryan's to show. He arrives, but he came with a few hired bodyguards as well. Ryan's and Geralt exchange threats. 
with Ryance also threatening Yennefer for the scar she had given him. Ryance claims to know where to find her and Ciri at. Ryance shoots a spell at Geralt, but his Wisher Medallion warns him and he's able to dodge it. Ryance then runs and leaves Geralt to deal with the bodyguards. Needless to say, four bandits stood no chance against Geralt, and especially at night when Geralt has had some Witcher elixirs. Geralt goes chasing after Ryance, while Philippa Eilhart begins questioning one of the men Geralt wounded. The man gave Philippa some information, but we are not told what the information is. Philippa then kills him by stabbing him with her knife. Geralt catches Ryance as he tries to open a portal, once again created by an unknown person. Ryance manages to seriously wound Geralt with a spell, but it looks like Geralt still caught Ryance. But Philippa Eilhart uses a spell to tie up Geralt and hold him back. Ryance manages to escape through the portal to safety. Geralt and Philippa have a confrontation as Geralt slowly bleeds out. Geralt knows that she figured out who Ryance works for, and wanted to keep that information away from Geralt. She says that Geralt is in so far over his head that he could not understand. Geralt threatens that he will kill anyone who dares harm Ciri before he loses consciousness. Now I'll go back to that piece that I skipped earlier. This takes place at the wizard Viljafort's house. The Council of Wizards doesn't really have a president or a speaker, but Viljafort is a young wizard whose opinion has recently become highly valued. He is not the literal leader of the council, but he is the figurative one. The sorcerer Artod Terranova and sorceress Tissaia de Vries have finished telling Viljaforts about the secret meeting between the kings at Hodge Castle. Viljaforts offers to discuss things further over food, and his assistant Lydia van Bridevort helps set everything up. Lydia is also a talented or a sorceress and talented painter, but she is also mute and can speak telepathically. A group of five wizards had at one time been investigating an artifact. The artifact was cursed and had devastating effects when activated. Three of the wizards were outright killed, another lost his eyes and hands and later his mind. Lydia's jaw and throat were so seriously wounded that even magic could not heal them, and a constant illusion is maintained to cover up the scars. The group later moves to Viljaforts' workshop so they can be safe from magical eavesdropping. While in the workshop, Tissaia looks around and manages to discover what Viljavort has been secretly working on. She is able to discern that he is using spells to try and find Yennefer, while also looking into ancient elven prophe prophecies of the Elder Elven Blood. Viljavort eventually goes about giving his suggestions on what to do about the King's meeting. He says that they cannot do anything about the Sentra invasion for now, because they are supposed to know nothing about it. If things get closer to actually happening, then they should step in. Some of the kings seem to have already begin, begun committing genocide against the non-humans, and he also suggests that a meeting be called to stop this activity. Artod suggests using many wizards who have influence over kings, and Yennefer is one of them. Viljaforts begins to discreetly change the subject towards Yennefer and Geralt, and how difficult they are to find. Tissaia is starting to get angry and suspicious of Viljaforts, as they are discussing rumors of Geralt's death. Tissaia says that she has recently heard Geralt is alive. The ominous response is, Viljavort smiled, and once more glanced at the letter lying in front of him. Is that so, he said. I don't think so. And this is the last major scene change of the book. We'll be spending the rest of the time following Ciri and Yennefer. Rumors at the temple are swirling about a war with Nilfgaard coming soon. Ciri's wizard training with Yennefer has gotten her out of a lot of work at the temple, and her friends are starting to hold it against her. She has made friends with a 16-year-old chronicler named Jara, however. Jara sounds like your stereotypical skinny nerd, and he is most certainly attached to Ciri. Ciri runs to the tower where Jara works after a fight with her former friends, and they begin discussing the rumors of war with him. It turns out that there was recently a border dispute at Dol Angra. We, the reader, know that this was probably staged to create a provocation for war, but nobody at the temple knows this. Jara does not think a war will come of it, and he and Ciri get close while discussing it. Jara does try to kiss her in the middle of this, but he is immediately shut down. Jara eventually composes himself and says that a war could not follow because there is no way the Nilfgaardians would have attacked at Dol Angra. They have nothing to gain from it, and it would give the Four Kingdoms a cause to instead go to war against the Nilfgaardians. As this discussion is being wrapped up, Ciri gets a telepathic message from Yennefer that she needs to see her. 
Siri leaves Jara and warns she may not be coming back. Jara is heartbroken, but responds well. When Siri arrives in Yennefer's room, she has several letters which she has been waiting for. Siri begins to bathe, and it has long been understood between these two that when these letters arrived, then they would leave. But Siri does not know where they are going or why. She tries to read the letters, but Yennefer quickly stops her. Yennefer will not tell her much either. The relationship between Yennefer and Siri is strange, and the story jumps back in time at this point to explain it. Just to reemphasize, we are going back in time at this point. I will be sure to point out when we are back in the present. Yennefer is extremely condescending towards Siri when they first meet, to the point of humiliating her at times. The neck asks Yennefer to be kind to Siri. The neck says that Siri is not Yennefer's rival. But Hearing the name Yennefer so frequently has sparked memories in Ciri's mind of when Geralt has also heard that name. It becomes clear that the two view each other as rivals of Geralt's love, and it drove them apart since before they met. Yennefer regularly calls Ciri surprise, referring to the consequences behind her birth. Other times, Yennefer just calls her ugly one. Ciri is desperate to get out from Yennefer's thumb and begins talking about how she could never even cast a basic sign when she was being trained by the witchers. But Yennefer does make a deal with Ciri. The two of them will be completely honest with each other while Yennefer works to test Ciri and see what she is capable of. The tests are simple but repetitive and begin to wear down at Ciri. They are similar to those inkblot tests that psychologists always use in movies, but these tests are supposed to check for magical ability. When she had too much of sitting at a desk looking at drawings, she asks Yennefer for a change of pace, and Yen usually easily accepts. They spend the next two days just running through the temple and acting like eight-year-olds. One day, they are laying in a grass field, relaxing, when Siri asks how much longer the test will be before Yennefer knows whether Siri can use magic or not. Yennefer says she knew almost immediately when Siri was able to see stars sparkling in Yennefer's necklace. Yennefer even points out that she is not talking to Siri with her mouth, but telepathically. Yennefer spends some time discussing magic theory as the two ride their horses through the wilderness. Some people consider magic to be chaos, some consider it to be a science, and some say art. The only one of these I'm going to go into is her explanation of chaos. Yennefer essentially says that there is a forbidden door behind which lies force of evil intent on destroying the world, and magic is the key to that door. I wanted to highlight this because it reminds me of the last dream Ciri had where she was running down a corridor with Yennefer and reached a forbidden door. After Yennefer explains how magic is chaos, art, and science, they arrive at a boulder which is a strong source of magic. Yennefer says, quote, Chaos extends its talent, talons towards you, still uncertain if you will be its tool or an obstacle in its design. That which chaos shows you in your dreams is this very uncertainty. Chaos is afraid of you, child of destiny, but it wants you to be the one who feels fear. It wants you to be afraid of the coming days, so that fear of what is going to happen to you and those closest to you will start to guide you and take you over completely. Yennefer then enchants Ciri using her necklace and yells, Speak, I command you. Ciri rapidly flies through multiple dreams, including her recurring nightmare with the Black Knight, one where Yennefer is injured on a horse, and one where Geralt is bleeding out on some stairs surrounded by fire. When Ciri regains consciousness, Yennefer says she will teach her how to push back against chaos. Yennefer does begin teaching Ciri, and she slowly makes progress. First the nightmares are eliminated, and then Ciri begins learning spells. Yennefer eventually tells Ciri to move out of her do dormitory and move in with Yennefer. As they made more and more progress and got used to each other, they began to even share jokes. Yennefer began asking about Ciri's past, and Ciri honestly answered what she could remember. Ciri began talking about her past of her own volition even, and discussed how she and Geralt met and broke alone during the story Sword of Destiny. Ciri made a joke about how Geralt reacted to finding out the truth about Ciri, and both she and Yennefer laughed. This was one of the final stages in their relationship. At last they were not competing over Geralt, but were friends who could express themselves about the man who, until this point, had been driving them apart. I just want to clarify that the relationship between Ciri and Geralt is not at all romantic, uh, but they are attached to each other like a father and a daughter. Yennefer later asks Ciri about her parents, Dunny and Pavetta. 
Siri says all she knows is that they died in a shipwreck. Once again, Yennefer tells Siri to look into her amulet, and she enchants Siri. Siri has a dream where she is standing on the docks of Sintra, and Jarl Krakenkrate is reporting to Queen Calanthe that Dunny and Pavetta were lost at sea. Calanthe says that one day Krak will pay back either the Queen or Siri for the mistake he has made which got them killed. Yennefer asks if that is when her magic dreams first began, and Siri says no. It was after she met Geralt and broke alone, but Geralt had left her. Yennefer finishes Siri's training by showing her how to find a magical intersection where she could draw magical power from. Siri does an exceptionally good job at finding the intersection. Yennefer gives her permission to draw the power from it, but she draws too much and ends up losing a good bit of blood through her nose. Nanette hears about it and is far from pleased, putting all of Siri's training on pause for a week. After a week, Siri has finally had enough and responds by just hugging Yennefer for a while. The next day, Yennefer and Nanette talk it out and training resumes. Later, Nanek is even persuaded to get Ciri's sword out of storage so she can continue to train. Ciri was never able to do a basic sign with the witchers, but Yennefer teaches her a simple spell which, much, which works much like the sign of Ard. Yennefer says that if Ciri can use the spell to shoot a basket far enough that it hits a shed behind, then they will have some wine that night. After three tries, Ciri manages to not only throw the basket, but also destroy the shed. In the final stages of their bonding, Ciri has picked up on some of Yennefer's wit and is able to throw insults right back at her, and they get to be pretty funny. But one exchange does stand out, and I've put it on the screen. Um, it might show some of what has been plaguing Yennefer for the three years that Geralt did not contact her. And now, we are back at the present for the conclusion of the book. In case you do not remember, Yennefer has just received a series of letters, and she is now making preparations to leave Milatel's temple with Ciri. Yennefer and Ciri leave the next day, and only Nanek sees them off. I will go ahead and include the last couple of paragraphs of the book on the screen. If you remember when Triss described what happened to her at Sodden, she also mentioned that Yennefer was left blind, and then magically healed. Sly references are made a handful of times to this throughout the book, and you can see one of them here when Yen refers to the apple of her eye. But the more imposing lines are at the end. So to summarize where things are, we have kings, queens, and emperors trying to kill Ciri. Nobody knows what the wizards are up to, and this includes the wizards. Ciri and Yennefer are going somewhere, but we don't know where. Geralt is injured after almost catching Ryans, but being betrayed by Philip Eilhart. Triss is nowhere to be found. The four kingdoms in Nilfgaard may be going to war, and Scoia'tael activity is increasing. The four kingdoms are using extremely violent methods to put the Scoia'tael down. There's a lot going on. I hope you enjoyed the summary. Please leave any feedback comments or suggestions in the comments below. Thank you.